Well, this is the video podcast for Theo Fantastique, and uh, today my guest is uh, Brandon Graffius, and I've had the privilege of working with him on a project, and another one has just surfaced, and we'll be talking about that a little later, but today we're going to be talking about his book, and I've got an awful review copy with a label. Brandon, you want to show them? Here's the, the preview the copy without the label. With yeah, we're going to be talking about that. Um, Brandon is Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at Ecumenical Theological Seminary, and I know you've got uh, more biography than that. You want to share a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Um, I've been at uh, Ecumenical Theological Seminary um, as an assistant professor for about 10 years. I started off as an MDiv student there first, uh, working on my Master of Divinity degree. Um, did my PhD at uh, Chicago Theological Seminary and kept on as an adjunct during that time at ETS and then have transitioned into a role as assistant professor. I have a master's in poetry from UC Davis from a, a previous life as well. Um, so I've done some done some different parts of academia, which I, I think are all combined in some kind of interesting ways. Um, I didn't think I'd be using the, the master's in poetry, but it's proven to be really, really an interesting um, component of my, my work as a biblical scholar. Yeah, well, before we get into the discussion of uh, some specifics about your book, I always like a little background. Uh, it's always interesting because uh, we bring so much of ourselves and our interests and passions Absolutely. to the subject matter. How did you come to a, a personal interest uh, as a fan and later as a scholar to horror, and how did you connect the dots to the Bible? Yeah, oh, that's um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting story because those aren't um, – areas that are usually connected. I've been a horror fan for as long as I can remember. I think I was about four years old when um, I, I, Scooby-Doo would be my afternoon routine. And as my dad came home from work, the first thing I'd have to do is greet him at the door to tell him who the bad guy was on Scooby-Doo that, um, that afternoon. Um, and that, that certainly introduces us to the ideas of the Gothic and all of these things. Um, the first real horror movie I remember uh, was uh, taping Something Wicked This Way Comes off of HBO and watching that movie until the, the VHS tape wore out. Um, that's one of those those movies that was somehow deemed okay for kids, I think because it had the Disney imprimatur on it. Um, but but really, it's it's a lot darker and a lot more, more grown up than um, most of the movies that I was watching at that time. So it really, really grabbed me. Um, and I, I found myself constantly looking for more things like that. I kind of filed that away and um, as a separate part of myself as I was pursuing scholarship. At the, when I was um, an undergraduate in the mid-90s and my first run at graduate school in the early late 90s, early 2000s, um, horror scholarship wasn't really much of a thing. I mean, Robin Wood and Noel Carroll had been doing their things, but it really hadn't um, disseminated out more widely into the the, the scholarly waters. Um, so I, I kind of, kind of kept that away, particularly as I was, uh, starting to, uh, my PhD program in biblical studies. Um, I was reading Anathea Portier Young's book, Apocalypse Against Empire. She's looking at, at how apocalyptic literature works as resistance literature, um, and talks some about how some of the, the Greek myths get repurposed by apocalyptic literature. There's kind of this brief footnote that she has about monster theory, um, which was kind of like a bolt of lightning that hit me. Wait a minute, this is really a thing? People can really study this? So I grabbed Noel Carroll and quickly got into Doug Cowan and Stephen Asma and tried to get myself caught up to speed. Um, and it wasn't too long after that that I was uh, reading through biblical texts, you know, still searching around for exactly what I was going to do for my thesis. And I uh, stumbled on Numbers 25. Um, mm. The Israelites are wandering through the desert. They start messing around with the foreign women. God tells them to knock it off. But then when one of the Israelite men brings a Midianite woman into the tent of meeting and they're doing something together, um, Phineas the priest picks up a spear and skewers them both. And I thought, wait a minute, that scene happens in Friday the 13th part two or, <laughs> or Bay of Blood, you know, right. me, going back to the original source. So that was the, the germ of my dissertation that became my first book, reading Phineas, watching slashers. <laughs> how did... Uh... How did this book come about? Uh, was it a research project for you? To talk um, about? So the, the second book, Reading the Bible with Horror, 
Um, it it kind of came about as all the all the things while I was working on my dissertation, all the ideas that are that are circulating around that I'm thinking of all these connections that I could be using with horror and the Bible that didn't fit into the dissertation because it was so focused on Numbers 25. Um, so yeah, um, years of of built up ideas while I was focused on the dissertation. Okay, well, can you summarize uh, the thesis? For folks, it doesn't sound reading the Bible with horror. It doesn't sound like it's a devotional. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I wouldn't wouldn't call it a devotional. Although I I do feel like um, I I certainly approach it from the perspective of a person of faith. Um, mm -hmm. I I feel like both religion and horror talk about um, religion. Usually talks about our hopes, and horror usually talks about our anxieties or fears. Although not always. Mm -hmm. um, but those two things are, those are two sides of the same coin. So when we're talking about hopes, our fears are the, the unspoken shadow side of that. And the same is true when we're talking about fears and anxieties. Hope is, is the other side of that. Um, so I, I think horror and religion are really closely connected. Um, and in our, our religious practices, when we ignore the, the parts of our experiences that are fearful or anxious. Um, we ignore a lot of what it means to be human. Um, I, I, part of my plea for reading the Bible with horror is that we should reconnect with those parts of the, the biblical tradition that are, are fearful, that acknowledge that anxiety. Um, I think the, the writers of the Bible were, were savvy enough, smart enough to realize that as a part of human experience, that needed to be in there too. Um, so one of my examples in the introduction is even though um, David has his beautiful psalm, number 23, uh, about um, being, uh, being the, the, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters and laying in green valleys. There's all this plaintive imagery, but there's also this idea of walking through the valley of the shadow of death that is in there as well. And I think sometimes we move so quickly to the green valleys that we, we skip over the shadow of death. Um, and that means that when we are feeling that anxiety in our lives, we sometimes don't have the, the resources that our tradition provides us to, to really, really work through those places. Yeah, I, I, when I make the joke about uh, not being a devotional, but in a sense, uh, it's not. But then you give a little pushback. It could be, you know, in some Christian traditions, um, you, they, uh, each week there are certain texts that you're supposed to read through so that by the yeah. end you've read through the whole Bible. So we're supposed to be engaging the entirety of the text, not only the ones that we consider more spiritual and light and yeah. inspiring, but also the dark ones. Um, religious conservatives or Christian conservatives at least, um, have given me some pushback. Uh, how you know, there's this connection, this reading with horror, horror is dark and bloody and gross. And yeah. uh, I really think there's a sanitized approach to the Bible, which many Christian conservatives bring. Why do you see there being a natural fit between the Bible and horror in the study that you've done? Well, the, I mean, the, the most obvious answer to that is that the Bible really is full of horror. <laughs> um, there there are, are bloody wars. Um, there's all sorts of nasty sexual violence that happens in the, the Hebrew Bible. Um, um, and and there's, there's fear and anxiety all throughout the Psalms. Um, for me, part of, part of the, the brilliance of, of the, the Bible, and um, you might even say part of the inspiration of it, is that it covers the full gamut of what it means to be human. And that includes the, the darkness, the, the, the fear, and the anxiety. Um, so that's that's part of it. Um, I also think that the the Bible is pretty smart about knowing that these things are a little bit dangerous. Um, I'm working on a piece for uh, for another project that's um, coming up with soon, where I, I talk about looking being a dangerous process. Um, the classic example of that is David um, and Bathsheba. Um, David looks <laughs> and gets himself in all kinds of trouble. Um, in many horror movies, this motif of looking as being something that gets you in trouble, um, is also something that's really, really a common thread. Um, examples that jump to mind immediately would be something like Sinister or The, the Ring, where watching those horror movies is dangerous. Um, so I, I don't approach it lightly. I, I do think there's something, um, yeah, dangerous is the word I keep coming back to about that experience. Um, but it's also something that 
if we don't engage with, to some extent, um, we deny a really important part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about definitions. Obviously, the horror genre as we know it now uh, wasn't around in ancient times, but mm -hmm. how, how are you defining horror as it relates to the ancient scriptural texts, and how does that connect to contemporary understandings of horror? Yeah, there there have been different ways to approach that. Um, one one of the earliest works of biblical scholarship that um, attempts to to use horror theory is Amy Kalmanovsky's Terror All Around, and she was really particular about using precise vocabulary, um, like we only want the vocabulary that uses um, terror. Um, looking particularly at the book of Jeremiah. So she's using vocabulary to mark the horror passages. That's certainly one way to do it. Um, I'm more interested in, in thematic connections. Um, for me, what, one of the chapters or one of the sections in reading the Bible with horror, I'm looking at the, um, the what are called the, the Sota laws of Numbers 5, also known as the bitter waters ritual, where if a woman is suspected of adultery, um, she's brought in front of the community and she's made to drink this uh, concoction that we don't know exactly what it is. And it seems like the idea is if she's guilty of adultery, it will induce a miscarriage. Um, so th clearly there's it, it's not a horror story per se. It describes a ritual rather than being um, a, a narrative discussion or a narrative tale. But at the same time, we see these same kinds of, of elements of, of, of fear, of um, well, the, the connection I make in reading the Bible with horror is in uh, the, the shower scene from Carrie, where she starts menstruating and doesn't know what's happening, that it becomes this same kind of a public shaming ritual where the, the sexuality of the woman is put on display and um, made monstrous. So my, my connection is that both of these are sections where the community is expressing their anxiety about the, the sexual power of women. So, so for me, I'm less concerned about whether Numbers 5 is or is not a horror story and more concerned about how can I talk about it with horror stories. Okay. As you were doing the research and the writing, uh, connecting these dots between the Bible and horror, what were some of the more striking examples of biblical horror for you? What stands out? Oh, um, that, that one with uh, Phineas that I talked about earlier, Numbers 25, really hit me over the head as being um, pretty much exactly like a, a 1980s slasher film. Um, and you can see all of the, the same anxieties. I, I tend to read the, the slasher films kind of in line with, with Robin Wood as being um, fairly conservative responses, um, participating in the Reagan revolution, backlash to the, the civil rights movements and the sexual revolution of the 60s. Um, and I see the same kind of impulses happening in Numbers 25, where you've got concerns over identity and concerns over how um, the patriarchy can maintain control of the society. So that one, that one was, was quite striking. Um, I thought one of the most interesting connections that, that kind of came into my head um, through this research was looking in... One of the chapters in reading the Bible with horror looks at haunted spaces of the Hebrew Bible. And I was looking at the house of David as being a haunted house. Um, and while there aren't ghosts in the David story, um, his predecessor, King Saul, meets a ghost, but David doesn't. Um, I still see the same kind of structure of trauma that is, is hidden and then repeats itself linked to particular locations. Um, so that, that you have this really interesting place where um, David sees Bathsheba from the roof of his palace, and that begins this whole downward spiral. Later on in the, the story, his son um, Absalom is rebelling against him, and he Absalom drags David's concubines up onto the, the roof and in a show of dominance and power um, basically rapes them on the, the roof of the palace. So that is also connected to this same location where David committed this original act of, of sexual violence. It, it's interesting and unnerving to me that many times religious believers can look at their sacred text and not see the, the horror in it. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know that they would think twice about uh, the text, you know, with uh, somebody being impaled, uh, two people for, uh, you know, this alleged sexual transgression. Um, 
with that in mind, what b benefit might there be for a religious believer in approaching the text through this lens, through this hermeneutical perspective? And what about for somebody who doesn't have any religious uh, commitments, but nevertheless is interested in, in looking at the Bible through the lens of horror? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think one of the things that can really, I think we should be honest about what our tradition entails. It's really easy for us as, as believers to ignore all the ugly parts of our scripture, um, think that the, the Bible is generally a more or less good book, um, and then when we see violent texts from other religions, we now can be judgmental because we've purified and cleansed our own text. Mm -hmm. So if we're honest about what what our text contains, it helps us look more kindly on other religions. Um, I think that's I think that's one real benefit. Um, and then then another another benefit is that it really, I think, does get us in touch with um, the struggles and the difficulties of our lives and give us resources for working, working through those. Um, the, the, the darker, more horrific parts of the Bible can really show us that, that the world can be a messy place and there can be struggles. And that is part of what it means to be human and, and part of what it means to be a human in relationship with God. We're not somehow failed or, or, wrong if we're we're experiencing frustration or darkness or hopelessness that's part of what it means to be human um from the perspective of of uh, perhaps interested non-believers um, i would would suggest that we we really do have um whether whether you call the bible your sacred scripture or not um it's deeply woven into our culture and so understanding all of the the, the ways that it, it reflects and refracts and is picked up and reshaped and, and reused by our culture is, I think, a really important way to get a deeper understanding of some things. Um, if you have an interest in horror movies, I think it's, it's really beneficial to learn more about the religious lens that they often employ. Um, and... Yeah, learning learning more about those those horrific texts in the Bible really gives you some of those those tools to interpret the horror movies on a deeper level. Yeah, I would I would agree, and I don't mean this just uh, as a means of guest flattery, but I really think reading the Bible with horror is uh, the kind of book I wish I would have written, and uh, I, I think it's a great one, and I encourage people to try and pick it up. Um, I also, we want to talk a little bit, you and I have been working for a while now uh, yeah. with some contributors on a volume on theology and horror. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's an exciting volume. Yeah. Um, John approached me, what has it been, uh, a little over a year ago now, a year I and a half? I think so, yeah. Something like that, about this, this idea. Um, there's a, a series coming out of Fortress Press, Fortress Academic and uh, Lexington Books called um, Theology and Pop Culture and all. Well, what if we we did a, a volume on theology and horror? So we're we're looking at all the or our contributors really are are looking at some different ways that that these disciplines intersect with each other. Um, so you know, Doug Cowan has a, a great essay where he's he's looking at um, ways that this idea of the religious imagination uh, functions in Clive Barker. Um, we've got uh, Steve Wiggins has a, a brilliant essay arguing that the roots of, of horror literature actually are in the, the Bible. Um, he's, he's really looking at it generically and arguing that we, we can find it there in, in the biblical text. Um, we've got readings of, of matriarchal religion in Silent Hill. Um, i trying to think what some of the other oh, a history of, of how, the, how religion has viewed werewolves. Um, just some really interesting intersections. It's a wide ranging volume that I think still hangs together um, with this idea of, of exploring how God and the monstrous are, are interwoven together. Yeah, I was uh, jazzed when we got approached by the publisher and said, hey, would you be willing to, to edit the volume? And one concern I have, and I think you're like-minded, is I just didn't want to do, uh, hey, let's look for Christ figures in horror films and, and all that kind of thing. I wanted, yeah. I said, look, let me type up a little abstract about what I have in mind. We, we want some latitude and freedom to kind of push the margins. And they said, yeah, go for it. So, Yeah, uh, looking for, for Christ figures in movies that can become like Where's Waldo pretty quickly. Yeah, 
If you're just, right, right. Hey, there's Jesus. Look, there he is too. Yeah, and it really just becomes an exercise in helping us feel better about uh, some of the things we enjoy in horror, really, you know, functionally. Yeah. And uh, there's room for that if people want to do it, but that's, sure. that's not what we want to do with this volume. So. And too often that that ends up trying to, to squeeze horror movies or whatever kind of film or literature you're looking at, squeeze it into the conventional doctrine of Christianity. Um, and our, our volume is really not interested in whether this is or is not orthodox, we're just interested in exploring, well, what is the theology here? What is it What is it saying? And how does that connect with other ideas through the history of Christian thought? Yeah, so that volume is, uh, we're in the finalization process, so hopefully later this year, maybe <laughs> by the fall, keep our fingers crossed, and uh, maybe we can come back and talk a little bit more about that volume and, and so yeah, on. Great. We also have one other thing that, Based upon an email we got this morning from Steve Wiggins, uh, we can make an announcement. You want to share Oxford University Press? Yeah, yeah. We are are starting work on the Oxford Handbook of Biblical Monsters, um, which should be a thirty five to forty chapter volume. Uh, I think we're looking at seven to eight hundred pages. Um, it's not going to be out anytime soon because we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, but we we really hope it will be a resource of of not only um, what are some of the monsters in the Bible, and where did they come from? But what are the what are the afterlives? How did they? How have they moved forward? Um, not only how has Leviathan developed from other ancient Near Eastern religions and shown up in Job and Isaiah and Ezekiel, but how has has he or she, depending on the text you're reading, moved into into contemporary culture and into horror films? Um, how does the, the biblical idea of angels play into angels in popular culture today? How is the idea of Satan developed from the earliest roots in, in the Hebrew Bible or, or possibly before into, into this idea that we have now of uh, you know, Lucifer at the piano bar? Um, <laughs> so I, I, I really, really hope it will not only provide scholars with some of those background, be kind of a, a one-stop shop for your, your monstrous history, um, but also some real deep explorations of, of how they, of, of how they are continuing conversations. Um, monsters that are consistently changing their form, adapting to new situations and, and being Im embodied with new meetings. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about it. It's an ambitious, it's a huge project, multi-contributor uh, over a number of years for us to pull all this together. But I think it'll make a, a good contribution to scholarship, and uh, and uh, it will either put us on the map or take us completely off it. So I'm not quite sure which one. But... <laughs> or put us in a quarantine. That's right, that's right. Like that. <laughs> Our own monstrous coronavirus or something. Who knows? So... But I'm looking forward to it, to working with you on this uh, this next project. So it'll it's be a project that I'm glad we figured out we like working together. Over That's the, right. Uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> There's going to be a lot together. But. Yeah. And we should also let folks know you and I also work together on uh, uh, on a, a relatively new online peer review journal. Yeah. Uh, which uh, oh, is exciting. It, it is. It's called the Journal of Gods and Monsters. Um, there was a, a conference at Texas State University Um I guess last year, yeah, called called Gods and Monsters. I think there's an edited volume coming out from that too that uh, Joseph Laycock and Natasha Mickles are putting together, and a few of the the people who worked on that that conference um, just thought there was a lot of energy around the topic and and wanted to see this this move forward. I think it's also kind of picking up a, a journal uh, that John you were involved in a while ago called Gollum that yeah. um, kind of fell by the wayside, but that there's still some excitement about this this topic. Um, so, so yeah, our, our first issue is where